distinguished ladies and gentlemen i begin by thanking the asia society for having me here today i am also delighted to have former prime minister rudwishas today i stand before you to share my thoughts on peace democracy and development nepali people have emerged through various struggles and transformations at different junctures of history at one point of time our forefathers fought against the imperialistic forces and our sovereignty and independence was preserved by their courage and patriotism the generation of my parents who were ordinary peasants had to fight to free themselves from the clutches of feudalism and oppressive regime their struggle uprooted the despotic family rule of ranas and my generation had to fight against an autocratic monarchy this was our final assault on an illiberal and undemocratic regime now the course of nepal's political history has changed we are a democratic republic but our fight is continuing in a different form as a fight against poverty under development and backwardness in the course of history our political gains have not come without heavy price several competitors made ultimate <coughs> sacrifice and got martyrdom many lived in political exile while others were brutalized and suppressed i feel a bit emotional when i recall those dark 14 years that i spent in jail including 4 years of solitary confinement my crime was that i fought against autocratic regime but this never deterred rather emboldened me to continue the struggle ladies and gentlemen as a result of our sustained struggle democracy was restored in 1990 however our fight for full fledged democracy continued we had never relented relented in our efforts nor was there any complacence towards our ultimate goal of progressive democratic republic an armed conflict that began in 1996 was successfully resolved through a peace accord signed in november 2006 key to this process was the famous 12 point understanding forged in november 2005 i was among those who played an important role in forging consensus to advance this process and bring the rebellion force to a negotiating table this brought the seven part seven party political alliance and the rebellion force together to mount a combined people's movement against an absolute monarch who had snatched people's rights through unconstitutional means the ensuing result forced the monarch to capitulate the armed conflict ended and peace process began the restored parliament clipped the wings of the ruling monarchy and suspended it until it was finally abolished 2 years later by a democratically elected constituent assembly the constituent assembly was highly inclusive having representation from all gender caste tribal and linguistic groups faith communities cultures geographical length and breadth of the country 
Dear friends, after seven years of consultations and deliberations, arguments and debates, demands and pressures, peaceful agitation and campaigning, a highly progressive and democratic constitution was finally written for the first time by people's representatives. As a leader of the second largest political party of that time, I had an important responsibility to steer the process to a successful conclusion. Finally, the constitution was promulgated on 20th September 2015. It has finally settled the political issue that the country confronted for a long period of time. This was a watershed moment in the political history of modern Nepal. I believe that the future generations may not have to go through the similar course of struggle for rights and freedoms anymore. Through the constitution, we consolidated democratic polity, republican order, periodic elections, universally recognized human rights, separation of power with checks and balances, rules of law, independent judiciary, and inclusive and proportional representation system. Implementation of the Constitution is as much important as its promulgation. I had the privilege of serving the nation as the first Prime Minister under the new Constitution. I was thus incumbent upon my government to take decisive steps to implement the Constitution as per the roadmap it has provided. The Constitution came into full implementation after free and fair democratic elections held last year for the federal, provincial, and local levels. With a historical ex election turnout, electoral turnout, the elections resulted in 41% of women's representation and formation of stable and democratic governments at all three tiers of the federal federation. The government I had enjoys three-fourth support of the parliament. The policies and programs of my government were unanimously endorsed by the parliament and exercised seen rarely in the competitive democracy. This proves that the fellow Nepalis repose trust in our leadership and our ability to deliver. Dear friends, we steered a successful peace process through inclusive political dialogue and deliberations and a spirit of accommodations. Ours was a homegrown, nationally led and owned peace process. In the process, we managed to reconcile competing demands and aspirations of our diverse population. We ensured equal participation of all stakeholders and heard their voices. We recognized the important role of women in conflict resolution and peace process. We transformed structures and institutions to mirror the mosaic of our society. And we brought the government closure to the people through restructuring of the state. The major thrust of the peace process has been to promote reconciliation in society, healing the wounds of conflict period. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a clear vision for the development of the country. I am aware of our strengths, challenges, and limitations. To sustain the political gains and deliver on the development dividend to our people, my government has set a long-term goal of prosperous Nepal, happy Nepal. To realize this goal, we must eradicate poverty, eliminate, eliminate inequality and discrimination, create employment opportunities, ensure social justice, promote good governance, 
and ensure effective service delivery. Our aim is to attain a comprehensive democracy that empowers individuals in all spheres of national life, political, economic, social, and cultural. I have a conviction that full realization of SDGs makes this possible. Nepal is a resource-rich country, but the level of development is well below our potentials. This mismatch must come to an end sooner than later. We have identified the drivers of economic growth, drivers of economic growth. These include no other vital sectors than agriculture, energy, industries, transport, infrastructure, information technology, tourism, and urban development. For making economic progress, sustainable parallel attention will be given to the climate change mitigation, adaptation, and preservation of biodiversity. Nepal is safe for foreign investment. The government remains committed to further improving business and investment climate in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, now let me turn briefly to Nepal's foreign policy priorities. Nepal is the oldest independent state in our region, with her own distinguished and glorious history. Amity with all and enmity with none remains at the heart of Nepal's foreign policy. This is inspired by the principles of UN Charter, Panchasil, Non-Alignment, International Law, and Norms of World Peace. We enjoy cordial and friendly relations with both our immediate neighbors, India and China. Economic growth and prosperity in neighborhood offers us a prom promising prospect for the development of our country. Our relations with major powers and development partners have been all along cordial and friendly. We would like to further develop and expand our cooperative partnership with them, extended neighborhood and level destination countries are also in our foreign policy priority. Nepal has been playing an active role for the promotion of regional cooperation under SARC and BIMSTEC. On multilateral front, Nepal's effort will be directed towards promoting a rule-based, just and equitable international order in which all states, small and big, fulfill their international obligations in good faith and all countries enjoy equitable opportunities to fulfill aspirations for development and prosperity. Before I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to state that Nepal's commitment to democracy and fundamental freedoms is total and unflinching. The long journey of our political struggle is synonymous to the struggle for democracy. We will not allow any compromise on democratic norms, values, and principles. We believe that democracy, development, and respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms are interdependent and mutually reinforcing. With these words, I conclude my remarks. I would be delighted to engage with you all in the interactive discussion. Thank you so much. Well, Prime Minister, once again, welcome to the Asia Society. Thank you so it's much. It's good to have you in New York and, and uh, great to have you here in uh, Asia's home in America. You said something very interesting in your remarks before. You said um, uh, that uh, Nepal is the oldest independent state in, uh, in Asia. Um, this, I think, is worth a few words to our American audience. You might explain a little bit of the history. Um, I know in the days of the British Raj, uh, you and Nepal gave uh, the British a very hard time uh, and uh, stopped them at your borders. So why don't you explain to our audience just a little bit of the history before we get into the current period. Uh, 
It's a matter of pride for us that Nepal remains always uh, an independent country. Uh, when uh, the uh, imperialistic era was uh, in such a situation where no sun was setting mm -hmm. of a colonial country. But uh, there was, uh, of course, in Asia, oil export, mm. where uh, the razor shadow of uh, colonialism were never cast. There, there was mm. always freedom, always independence. So how did you stop the British? Uh, None yeah. of the rest of us did. Yeah. <laughs> of course, uh, we had to sacrifice for that. Uh, we had to fight. Uh, our ancestors fought uh, with a knife. Uh, they are just knives mm. and against the cannons and guns. But uh, they resisted and the country remained always sovereign. And uh, we had to, we lost the war, of course, and we had to lose some parts, territory mm. of the country. And uh, we were compelled to raise in agreement, but uh, the sovereignty of the country was again uh, continued. It was mm. preserved. Well, it's a remarkable achievement across, let's call it, uh, colonial Asia, where for four to five hundred years, really, you had one country or civilization after another falling to the British or the French or the Dutch or the Spanish or the Portuguese. So, well done. The, um, which brings us to the present period of politics and, uh, and the remarkable period of the last uh, quarter of a century. Uh, you had some return to democracy in 1990 and then a very torturous path uh, through to the promulgation of the new constitution of 2015. And then you have the elections of last year, uh, where um, you were elected uh, with a 64% majority uh, on behalf of the Nepal Communist Party. Uh, I was told before that uh, when you were nominated for the parliament, um, you had uh, something in excess of 78% of the parliament in support of you. And for the government's program, when you put it to the parliament with 100% parliamentary support. Now, why wasn't I able to achieve that in Australia? So. <laughs> Tell me how you got to there with this extraordinary development of the, the constitution uh, over that period of time. And what stability do you think it gives the country for the future? We have not that very long history of democratic movement, but uh, we have history of uh, different types of movements. As we talk about the movement uh, for sovereignty, movement for independence, etc., and uh, movement for social awareness and against autocratic regimes. Uh, but uh, finally, in 1951, Nepal was entered into a new uh, era. After the downfall of Rana oligarchy, the family rule of the Ranas. And after that, there was again talk of war between, for the power between the political parties, democratic forces, and the monarchy. The monarchy was still over there. And uh, in 60, uh, again, uh, the monarchy took over. Uh, unconstitutionally and forcibly, uh, the democracy was again, uh, the absence of democracy was not accepted by the people. But uh, for 30 years again we had to fight. And we were watching the ups and downs of the global uh, movements and achievements of the democratic movements and failures of uh, different types of ups and downs. And with this experience, we uh, launched a struggle mm. for democracy, for the cause of democracy. As I mentioned that I spent uh, myself 14 years in prison, but I am not uh, the person who spent the longest period in prison, but more than me, there are others also. And so many people were killed. And after that, we 
formed an alliance mm. uh, between uh, different types of uh, parties who believe in democrat mm. democracy, who are against autocratic regime. Mm. And uh, uh, the moment in 1990, in 90, it was successful. And we, uh, at that time also, promulgated new constitution, but that was not enough and that was not um, uh, drafted and promulgated by the Constituent Assembly, by the representatives of the people. So it was not uh, exactly um, properly uh, accepted by the people. People were willing to promulgate the Constitution by themselves, by their representatives. And we, we did that after uh, some years. But uh, during this period, we had uh, uh, some uh, rebel groups, uh, and there was violence, mm. and uh, there was different types of struggles. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned that in 2005, there was 12-point understanding between the rebels and the mm. democratic forces. Against, it was particularly against autocratic monarchy, autocracy. Mm. And then we, uh, well, we, we got success that uh, people uh, supported uh, the alliance and supported that moment, popular moment. And uh, in 2006, April, uh, as I mentioned in my speech, that uh, uh, there was uh, a new turning point, the mm. dissolved parliament, which was dissolved by the, unconstitutionally dissolved by the king, was restored and that clipped the uh, power of the king. And after that, constituent assembly elections took place. And the first constituent assembly failed to promulgate the constitution, but it gave one very important contribution to Nepalese politics, that is, uh, that ended the monarchy and declared Republican, mm. one thing. And, uh, but uh, we had to, again, uh, go to the uh, next election for uh, Constituent Assembly in 2013, and that promulgated the Constitution within 20 months about after the elections. And, but uh, there was one, another problem, uh, in April, there was, in April 2015, when we were going to promulgate the Constitution, draft the Constitution, we were at the final stage of the drafting of the Constitution. At that time, the earthquake was, devastating earthquake took place. Mm. 9,000 people lost their lives. 23,000 people were wounded. And 900,000 houses and uh, monuments, etc., were destroyed. In such a situation, even then, in September 20. We promulgated the new constitution from the Constituent Assembly. And our, uh, at the same time, we abolished monarchy. At the same time, we settled the problem of conflict. There, and we uh, uh, managed the arms and uh, combatants of the uh, uh, rebels and promulgated the constitution. And then, uh, new government was there, and I got opportunity to lead the government. Hmm. And uh, with uh, uh, a feeling of accommodation and addressing the demands of uh, the people, of course there were some differences, and of course there were some uh, uh, differences and class. Uh, we can say not class, but uh, differences, uh, and. Uh, on the question of interest, and interest groups were, of, of course, active mm. uh, to insert their interest inside the uh, Constitution. That was very usual. But uh, more than, even uh, in such a situation, more than 92% uh, of votes were in favor of Constitution. Mm. And later on, there was uh, unanimously the Constitution was uh, accepted, and all the forces took part in the elections. Bringing together the Nepali Communist Party must have been a challenge. You have previously you have Maoists, the Revolutionary Party, 
Mm. And uh, that is, you obtain political power through the barrel of a gun. Um, I've read the history of communist movement. And back in the days of the Third International, uh, we split between parliamentary parties and revolutionary parties. Um, and then there's this um, uh, democratic parliamentary tradition of communism also in Nepal. How did you manage to bring these two things together? Not easy. In my opinion, the world is uh, very dynamic. Everything is being changed. And in the history, America raised weapons time and again for different reasons. And uh, in the course of democratic movements also in different parts of the world, democratic forces, neither left nor right, uh, uh, either left or right, there was no difference but for uh, democracy, for uh, their uh, causes, there is weapons hmm. in history. Hmm. So only the Maoist party isn't single party to raise the weapons. Hmm. But uh, Nepali Congress uh, and uh, other political parties also in Nepal raised weapons against Rana oligarchy and other uh, hmm. autocratic systems uh, different times. Uh, and uh, uh, the people, when the constitutional ways and peaceful means and ways are blocked mm. and the voices and interests of the people are suppressed by the force, then people tolerate for some time and they retaliate after some time. That was, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, we resolved, uh, we, we uh, settled the problem of uh, violence and that is important. We don't want to go back to the history, mm. but more than that, we want to bring change in the society. There was violence, people mm. were being killed. Yep. Mm. And the situation is now changed, and that is important. Situation is changed, and there is peace. Uh, uh, combatants are inside the, uh, some, some of them are inside the army. They are included, accepted in army. And some of them were, uh, they went back mm. to their own jobs. Even they got some incentives. And uh, weapons were handed over or destroyed. So now the political party completely gave up the policy of violence. Mm. Yes, of course, sometime, once upon a time, they were telling that political power comes out from the barrel of the gun. They were telling like that, but now they say that from the ballot it comes, and they are getting everything from the ballot. That's a very good change in slogan. Actually. Yeah. From the barrel of a gun through the ballot box. Yes. Must be interesting, though, if you're a, uh, a government of Nepal made up of the Nepali Communist Party. What's it like sitting now with the sitting down with the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government? Um, do, do your old Maoists have discussions with their old Maoists? Uh, I don't think so. In my opinion, I think we have uh, we have a, as I mentioned before to in my speech that uh, uh, we have a long history of sacrifice and a struggle, mm. and uh, now we have entered into a new mm. era of economic development. Mm. Uh, we fought for political freedoms for a long time once and again. Mm. But now, there is constitution, there is system, there is uh, uh, elected government, there are three uh, tires of governments, and uh, the turnout uh, of the votes in the elections was very excellent, more than 70%. At the first round, there was more than 80%, and mm. uh, uh, even in the last round, mm. Uh, there was uh, more than 70% uh, turnout of the uh, boards. Uh, so uh, people are enthusiastic mm. in this uh, uh, political change, and we have completed uh, transitional phase. And now our focus is to, as I said, that we have friendship with all, mm. no enmity. No, we, have, we have just uh, uh, friendship. And uh, we, we have uh, very good relations with Chinese Communist Party, with 
डेमोक्रेटिक पार्टी ऑफ यू एस ए रिपब्लिकन पार्टी ऑफ यू एस ए विथ प्रेसिडेंट ट्रम्प विथ सी चिंगपिन विथ मिस्टर मोदी And well, others. that covers three very interesting and, bases. And, and we, <laughs> and we want to get support from all for yeah. our development. Yeah, yeah. We we are working for. We have a stable government now, majority government, and now we cannot wait for a longer time. We have to eliminate poverty. We have to meet uh, uh, SDG goals within twenty thirty. We have to. Um, uh, meet our target of uh, graduating our country from LDC mm. uh, within two three years, uh, and uh, we have to bring fundamental change in our society economically. Mm. Uh, so we focus our our uh, uh, efforts, mm. our uh, resources, our strength mm. for good governance and for. economic development but it's not enough mm. it will be late if ourselves we do so we need support and cooperation from our friends as well from south from north it means mm. from india from china we have very good relationship with, with both of we we don't uh, care about the colors mm. let's say um that's a uh, a good approach well congratulations on the political achievement politics is hard and you've suffered a lot personally uh and uh, bringing about a democratic constitution given the complex history is no small achievement but as you've just said you're going on to look at the future you've got a new national economic development strategy you have 30 million uh, nepalis uh across a vast country uh, in terms of its mountainous terrain uh, challenges of transport infrastructure of telecommunications of education of health services give me a sense of your development strategy uh over the next um 4 or 5 years and as you said um where are you now seeking uh international uh investment uh we cannot just focus our efforts in one direction because uh, we have to develop from each and every aspects and angles like two third of majority of our population depends on agriculture and mm-hmm. agriculture is not advanced not developed uh so we have to modernize our agriculture commercialize our agriculture and mechanize mm. and by this process we have to bring the people out from agriculture to the industry maybe a small industry agro based industries and others and in service sector in tourism in uh, commerce sector we have to bring the people mm. out from uh, agriculture because that uh, huge number of population is not necessary for the agriculture Mm. sector and without modernizing without mechanizing uh, this sector we cannot do this so mm. uh, we have to give priority to uh, the agricultural sector as well mm. and to bring change in the agricultural system mm. uh, we have to to increase production agricultural product, products uh, we have to use new technology for the production mm. increment of production uh in this way uh but we cannot uh, just uh, uh as i said that i we we cannot uh, uh give priority just for one area mm. but uh, at the same time for in- infrastructure for connectivity for uh, it sector and uh, for establishing industries and um, uh, to bring balance uh, our business mm. our uh, uh, trade which is quite unbalanced mm. uh, uh, in a in in balanced situation now uh, we have to bring in uh, positive direction to this for that we have to increase production mm. 
we have to uh, produce export items. We have to lessen our uh, import mm. items. Uh, in this way, we have to work in different areas for uh, that we have to prepare our women resource, uh, formal education, and as well as vocational trainings mm. to the uh, relevant people. Whatever job they do, mm. uh, their skills and trainings, they must provide it. Uh, in this way, and, and another way, that uh, we have to invite for an investment as well, uh, so that uh, we are trying to create uh, such an environment where uh, foreign investment is hmm. uh, attracted to come. One of the projects which uh, has attracted some controversy in your own country is the major hydroelectric dam. From memory, I think it's about 1,600 megawatts. It's a big dam. Um, uh, it was um, suspended for a while and then has been uh, recommenced. I think there's a, a Chinese um, uh, construction firm from memory, Gojoba, Mm -hmm. um, the um, uh, once built uh, this, as I read it, uh, this dam would uh, double the installed capacity of your country. So, where's that project up to? How important is it, and how controversial does it remain within your country? Some months before, when um, Indian Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi was visiting Nepal, then we, me and him, both inaugurated the Arun Third project. Mm. That is 900 megawatts project. Mm. That we uh, lay down the stone. Not inaugurated, lay down the stone. And that is in progress, and that will be the first big project. And uh, uh, to be completed. And Similarly, we are inviting uh, investors from all over the world. Mm. And we are uh, giving attention to uh, reach in power purchase agreement with different countries. And during the some one and a half months before BIMSTEC summit, we uh, signed agreement about cross-border transmission lines where we can uh, sell our electricity to other countries also, to India, to Bangladesh, and to other countries also. And in this way, countries now can invest in Nepal and mm. hydropower sector mm. because they can sell mm. uh, the electricity to other countries also. And ourselves, we need more electricity. There is even now shortage of electricity, and we are also even now we are buying about 400 megawatts of electricity from India. Uh, and of course, um, uh, you asked about the Bodhi Gandaki, that is one project. Uh, we decided to study, the project was given to, awarded to Chinese company Gajawa Bifu, mm. but I don't know why that was uh, again terminated. Mm. And now, again Gajawa applied mm. to work, showed the interest. And uh, we said that, okay, we'll study, and for study, and to have talks, with the uh, Gajoba company, we decided to give authority to the Ministry of uh, 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 Energy. Uh, and that is uh, beneficial for the country. Mm. And there is no controversy. Mm. If other countries want, mm. they can invest because we have enough capacity, enough potential of hydropower, and very attractive projects we have they can, they can invest. Mm. So uh, for other countries also, other investors also, if they want, mm. there are projects ready to, 
And if uh, any companies are, any countries are interested, we welcome. Good. Well, the message to everyone here in New York is Nepal's uh, open for business, <laughs> open for investment. And uh, all of you here who have come in the door from Wall Street, uh, you can take uh, a card from the Prime Minister's delegation later. Now, we're open to questions, uh, Q&A here. And so um, as people throw their hand up, if you could give me your name, where you come from, and a short question. If you start delivering a speech, I'll probably ask you to sit down. So, and we Australians are notoriously impolite about such things. And so, sir, you were first with your hand up. Yeah. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to New York. Thank My you. name is Mark Munger. I had the privilege of serving as a Peace Corps teacher in Elam Jila in Mechianchal during 1966 and 67 and have visited many times to see my students and friends. The path of development assistance in Nepal has perhaps been uneven. What can the people and government of what Nepal his name? expect of donors to improve development assistance? And what may donors expect of the people and government of Nepal to improve development assistance? So your name again, sir, was? Mark Munger. Mark Munger, who uh, has been previously a Peace Corps uh, worker in Nepal. Um, and uh, I can't interpret that for anybody. <laughs> so, Prime Minister. Uh, exactly. I couldn't catch his... Uh, I, uh, my attention was that he was uh, working in eastern Nepal. Yeah, he's my a Peace Corps worker. And his question yeah. essentially was, how do we improve the circumstances in the country uh, for development assistance projects into the future. Am I right, sir? Yes, sir. Good. There you go. Uh, uh, I would like to thank the US government, first of all, for MCC project. Very. Uh, attractive project and before I leave Nepal this time, cabinet decided that uh, project is uh, a project of national pride that MCC is launching. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, our friends from all over the world, different countries are supporting us as you mentioned that uh, you were a Peace Corps um, uh, volunteer uh, in the 60s. And uh, Elam, at that time, perhaps there was no motorable road. Perhaps you had to go uh, uh, by foot uh, from Japa. Uh, and uh, since then, our friends are supporting to uh, cooperating, supporting donating to Nepal for its uh, improvement. And now, the situation is completely different. Uh, when you were in Nepal at that time, the campaign was being launched by the US government to eradicate malaria in Tarai, and plain lands of Tarai. But now the situation is completely changed. The level of education, level of skills, uh, and level of economy uh, and mostly the political situation and social environment in Nepal is completely changed. Before, uh, if a foreigner appears somewhere in the market or in the district or in the village, people were coming to see them. But now the situation is not like that. So many foreigners are wandering uh, here and there. And uh, that is not, uh, nothing new for the people of Nepal. And, and the political situation is very favorable because there is democracy, there is transparency, there is accountability, and the government is committed to uh, develop economically. And for that, as I said, that uh, uh, we are concentrating our entire efforts, strength, and resources for economic development. Uh, for that, good governance is 
uh, like prerequisite as we were thinking. And we are trying to uh, convince our friends to support us in this crucial juncture, in this uh, important juncture, uh, that uh, if we proceed in a, and take a speed, then we can go ahead. Mm. But now we are starting. Mm. So we have to gear up. In, in uh, such a situation, we need assistance and cooperation. And uh, as well as investment. And if there is anything, the investors know what type of environment we have to create for investment. What is their demand? We can talk to them and uh, we can uh, try our best or we'll, uh, of course, create the situation, um, uh, favorable situation for the investment too in each and every sector because we have um, uh, in agriculture sector, in educational, in health sector, in hydropower sector, in other um, uh, tourism sector, in hotel sector, in uh, there are so many sectors we have to develop. Mm -hmm. So uh, support in education, in health and in other areas as well and um, investment as well uh, in each and every sector is needed. Now, I'd like to encourage women in the audience to get their hand up as well. I like to keep a gender balance flowing here. Um, a lady at the back. That's uh, you, Mum. Thank you, Prime Minister. We cannot hear, I'm sorry. Uh, no, we'll get you a substitute microphone, though. Try it one more time. No. Namaste, everybody. Um, my name is Sherry Anna. I've had the good fortune and opportunity to serve as co-founder and program coordinator for Dance Theatre of Nepal in New York for the last 20 years. My question is short. It's two parts. The first part is, in view of the development that is obviously important to every country, how is Nepal responding to the kind of disaster capitalism that millions of Americans have agreed is destroying this country through horrific <coughs> brutality in factory farming, do, causing terrible climate change and the rest. There are a lot of investors in there doing okay. terrible mm, things next all over question. the world. Yeah. Second question is, uh, we know that education and health are very important challenges here and in Nepal. What steps are being taken in terms of curriculum to teach very small children, teens, students of all ages, that the caste system is dead and is antiquated. Okay, thank you for that. So there's a good sharp uh, question you, for you. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, we are talking about the economic development, but it doesn't mean that we do not care about uh, other aspects and uh, consequences of uh, economic development. And we are not giving a stress on economic development alone, but as well as aware, being aware of the environment. And we do not uh, exploit the earth beyond its capacity and uh, destroying the balance of the uh, ecological system and um, the environment. Uh, and. Uh, uh, we are careful about that, and particularly we have to be careful because uh, we are a mountainous country, and the climate and uh, weather produces uh, uh, the the mountains and the ocean produce the climate and weather. So uh, it's very important that uh, I want to. Uh, make clear about our vision that uh, we are mountainous country, so we are not uh, talking for our own interest. But it is not only interest of our country and our people and our area, but uh, the question of uh, climate, climate change, global warming, 
etc. is related to the ocean and to the mountains. Mm. And we have mountains and mountains. I, I used to say that uh, uh, some uh, uh, 15, 20 meters uh, thick ice, our 30% of land is shouldering it. 15 to 20, 25 meters thick layer of ice. Why? That is to gradually recharge the earth, gradually recharge the other hilly areas, mm. gradually recharge the plain areas. So, if, and, and there is another aspect, if the seas are polluted, then the cloud goes up with the acid and pollution and the acidic snow or water or rain falls on the mm. mountains and the ice cannot remain there. It means the recharge system of the earth and natural cleaning system of the earth is destroyed. It means there is devastation in the future. So while we are giving uh, importance to the question of economic development at the same time carbon emission and other mm. so, so many areas we are giving attention so renewable energy we are giving stress and as we talked before about the high dam project and reservoir project it is necessary not only for the production of electricity but also to maintain the uh, temperature of the earth, mm. to control global warming system, which is increasing very seriously. Mm. And this morning, we heard that uh, the Secretary General was raising this question very seriously, uh, the question of uh, global warming and the climate change. So we are aware of all these things. Uh, so um, in the first question, I would like to uh, be assured that Nepal is very seriously uh, working and trying to draw the attention of the world on this question. And this question should not be left alone on us because we are being a mountainous country. But uh, others also should share this important question. And second, as you said that uh, uh, the question of health and education, of course that is very important and I want to make it clear that the uh, social values and norms and social system, family system, and uh, the relationship between people and people is a little bit, we can fry it, of our civilization, of our social system, of our culture, and our combined family system as well. For five generations live together in one house, and in our ethnic groups, so many groups are like such, how many members you have in your family? If we ask them, they say that 135. They eat in the same pot, in the same kitchen. They live in different hearts, but they are the same around. They have hearts. And it's bigger than your average Irish Catholic family. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, our education is based on our glorious past and very important and valuable present social systems and we look forward and go ahead with modern scientific and techno technical mm -hmm. technological knowledge as well so uh, we give slogan prosperous nepal and happy nepali Prosperity itself is not enough to get uh, or to make the people happy. 
people cannot be happy alone with prosperity but uh, there must be atmosphere of that sort of atmosphere where people can be happy mm. otherwise uh, we may have uh, enough property or money but if there is threat of life or there is humiliation there is discrimination then we cannot be happy so a civilized society with prosperity prosperous and civilized so that prosperous and happy we we didn't say that just prosperity but prosperity and happy prosperous nepal happy nepali that the slogan we coined hmm. uh, we had mm, thousands of years before our ancestors told that they chanted some mantras sarve bhavantu sukhinah sarve shantu niramaya in sanskrit that was some uh, 4-5,000 years before they said that all should be, be all uh, happy uh, and peerless, uh, prosperous. Hmm. That was the slogan. I'm looking at your ambassador because our time has actually passed, but I'm going to ask if we've got time for two more questions nod or shake your head, whichever is appropriate. They're, they're nodding happily. Uh, they look prosperous as well. So <laughs> the, uh, they're prosperous and happy up the front here. Now I'm going to take um, the lady here and, uh, and there's a gentleman in, who's in the middle of the back there. That's you, sir. Behind the chap in the, um, in the uh, uh, salmon cap. So you first, ma'am, and then back to you. And then I'll, I'll wind up. Prime Minister, my name is Jean Ingwit, Vietnamese Americans. Would you kindly share with us the secret of the Communist parties in the past? How did your Communist parties have so many different parts of Communist parties in it? And how did you work so well to be so success successful compared to many other Communist nations in the world? And I admire you, and I wish you all the best. Would you? There was a saying that they, people should call your country a social democratic society rather than a communist party. Would you agree to that? There's two good sharp questions for you, <laughs> Prime Minister. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, in my opinion, if there was no social, uh, uh, this. Uh, solar system, then the meaning of universe would be nothing. If there was no earth and solar system, the solar system would be meaningless. If there was no life in the earth, earth would not be perhaps meaningless. And among them, human being and the my human brain is the most important thing in my opinion. But we diverted a little bit, uh, sometimes giving unnecessarily importance to our interest and selfishness. So we knew to make differences and quarrel, but uh, forgot to work together and live together. So we have started a new campaign, let's work together, live together listen others, and if there are differences, okay, there are different heads, different minds, there may be differences too. So we can tolerate those, and tolerance, coexistence, and our country is a country of diversity, from highest peak of the world, and within a very short um, uh, distance of uh, about 200 kilometers, there is uh, low land just a few meters above the sea. In such a situation, we have uh, social and other diversities also, biodiversities, and so many diversities. So our country is the country of diversity, and the diversity teaches us to live together. We are mountains. If there were no mountains, then there would be no life. 
no rivers without mountains no fountains no streams and if no rivers no stream no water no ice then there would be no life so we we knew uh mountains are high and the plain are low but they are uh interrelated so i think that we have to tolerate each other listen each other respect each other work each other and and live together uh and uh, this is uh, particularly my principle so that i tried my best to bring together all the diverse opinions and interest in one place common opinion for the nation for the people and for the human beings for the betterment of for the nation for the people and for the human beings the that very, is the idea very last questions a chap up the back in the middle let's you sir yep thank you um i can't hear you third time lucky third time's the charm um mr prime minister my name is ashwin joshi i work at an investment management firm here and i am from kathmandu nepal um my told you would bring wall street <laughs> Um my question to you is many in Nepal are excited about the rail that will connect China to um to uh, to Kathmandu and China is really excited to give us the debt that we need to to build that as well. Um uh, many countries in our neighborhood have fallen into that debt trap um including Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Malaysia. How do you suggest or what, what how how are you um looking to avoid falling into the same debt trap and 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 prime minister rod as as an expert on china i'd love to hear your opinion on this as well this is this prime minister's forum not mine so, <laughs> so uh, that's called avoiding the question so over to you pm okay uh, exactly speaking i don't understand what is the meaning of that uh, very uh, debt trap uh countries are getting loan investing we need and very cheap rates loans we need of course and we invest uh to save us from debt trap if there is any country any bank to provide us without any interest we welcome that <laughs> otherwise uh there is no way we need money we need investment we need support and not only without uh, interest also if uh, countries can donate us being based on our priority and our necessity otherwise we do not accept we, with our priority and necessity if somebody donates us that's welcome must welcome if not without interest again welcome and in cheaper interest that's good we do not uh, accept uh, from any there is no compulsion for us to accept so no question of debt trap etc i think uh, i i don't know exactly the what the meaning people want to say debt trap I think Prime Minister it proceeds from a recent uh, IMF report on the extent to the impact of um, various loans extended by our Chinese friends in particular for Belt and Road Initiative projects and it's a relative calculation about the capacity of the national budget of the country in question to sustain that debt on its balance sheet to repay over time. I think as you correctly said it becomes a set of sovereign decisions. but how much is tolerable uh, within normal receipts over time they got into our priority and necessity absolutely it's yeah. a sovereign matter i think as we uh, draw our discussion to a close um, prime minister the um i'd like to uh, commend you for your remarks on climate change leadership uh, and uh, the 
uh, view that you have about your particular significance given where you are in the Himalayas. Uh, and for all of us who are concerned about the planet, as I am and have been throughout my own public career, thank you. In terms of um, collaboration with you and Nepal on these questions, we at the Asia Society run a climate change program uh, on Asia, and we would like to discuss that further with you because we see uh, what happens to the snow-capped mountains of your country and more broadly across the Himalayan mountain range as fundamental to so many questions for the future of the planet and for the river systems yeah. and the people who are fed yeah. by it. Um, so thank you for that leadership. Um, then um, uh, a question, uh, a brief one, as I've listened to you carefully this evening. I've admired the fact that um, you have been a campaigner for a long time. Uh, easy for us in Western democracies. All the fights happened 100 years ago, okay? Sometimes 200 years ago. Uh, French took quite a long time. It wasn't entirely peaceful either. Um, uh, but for you, it's been quite recent. And so how did you sustain yourself personally and spiritually uh, in 14 years in prison and with four years in solitary? That this is a hard thing, a very hard thing. There were two ways, mm -hmm. two alternatives. Either, that was not my choice. And uh, either I had to die. I didn't die. <laughs> We've worked that out. Yeah. So I had to, anyway, bear whatsoever. That was... Uh, that uh, if it was my choice, then you may say me that uh, you are quite foolish. Why you choose that way? That was not my choice. I, I fought for democracy. I, I was demanding democracy, not imprisonment. Mm -hmm. And when I was arrested and imprisoned, then I had no choice. I had to spend there. I had to sit there anyway until I am alive. Mm. And... Uh, the situation was not favorable, of course. Not like now. Now the situation is changed. If uh, if uh, people are inside prison, even then, the uh, uh, conditions in prison, inside prison, are very different. Now police cannot torture. Uh, you cannot um, uh, keep people without food. But for one and a half month, I watch food without food. One and a half months. Months. Wow. And uh, I was so heavily tortured, but there was nobody to shout against that. Nobody was raising question. Mm. That was simple, because I was against autocracy. Mm. If somebody fights or raises voice against autocracy, has to suffer. Mm. That was a simple thing. So those days were completely different than of today. So, today, I'm Prime Minister. If I use even a simply tough word, then people say, what is this? But at that time, everything was done. But that was acceptable. Not acceptable, but there is no way. Hmm. So, the life in prison uh, is not a very memorable type of thing. Hmm. That is, uh, it was very tough, unpleasant. Dangerous. And uh, I continuously fought. I didn't bow down on my head because for the future generation, the situation should be changed. Mm. I, I had to tolerate everything, but uh, I cannot uh, <coughs> permit the situation go on forever to tolerate for our generation to generation like me, in prison, in isolatory confinement. 
So we had to end the autocracy for that reason. So that uh, in Nepal now nobody needs to go prison except who uh, are who commit social crimes, etc. For that law and order, for to control and to provide security and protect the rights of the people, to control crimes, control drugs, control torture against women, control other unsocial activities. Only people are punished and that according to the law of the land. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, could you please express uh, your thanks for the attendance of uh, His Excellency K.P. Sharma Oli, the Prime Minister of Nepal. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for coming to be with us at the Asia Society this evening. We've got other things happening in the week, as uh, Tom Nagorski mentioned uh, earlier on. Uh, visits by the Foreign Ministers of uh, Singapore, the Foreign Secretary of the United Arab Emirates, and uh, Dr. Mahathir Mohammed. Uh, in conversation with me on uh, Thursday morning. That should be fun. Um, look forward to seeing you at our future events. Good evening to you all.